Haiti is the country in the western half of the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean Sea, and it's recently been in the news because its president, Jovenel Moïse, was assassinated in his presidential palace in Port-au-Prince by a group of mercenaries. This is the first time that a Haitian president has been assassinated since 1915. In this video, I'd like to pose the question of who might have been behind this act of terror, this murder of a head of state, and also to look back at Haitian history and to see if these are the same historic patterns that are being repeated. As such, this video might be quite long, so I'll leave timestamps in the description for if you want to look at a precise part of Haitian history or whether you want to get straight on and look at this new case that's happening now. Before getting into that, a quick word from today's video sponsor, which is Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a paid for video streaming service with thousands of different documentaries that you can gain access to with a small monthly fee. They cover many different topics like science, nature and history. I'd like to recommend one in particular today, which is from a series called The Evolution of Evil that looks at famous dictators. The specific episode that I think you should take a look at is about Papa Doc or François Duvalier, who I will be mentioning later on in this video, but this episode takes a close look at his life and his terrible deeds as a dictator in Haiti, and also of the more colourful but completely ruthless aspect to his character. So it's a really great watch and you can have access to this and many other documentaries on similar topics by going to Magellan TV. There's even a special offer for viewers of this channel. You can either go to the description or simply type try.magellantv.com slash history with Hilbert for a free month of premium membership. It's really worth checking out. So do check it out because that does help out the channel as well. And you can get access to all these great documentaries. But anyway, let's dive into it. As I mentioned, the first part of this video, and by far the largest part, we'll look at the general history of Haiti before looking at the more recent events with the assassination of the president. People have been living in Haiti since around 5000 BC when they crossed over from mainland South America. One of the largest of these groups that came over and culturally influential were the Taino people who came over from mainland South America and who left rock art from a very early period when they were there mixing with other cultures that had also crossed over. And in fact, the name Haiti itself comes from a Taino word and there are still traces of the Arawakan language that was spoken by them in the modern day Haitian Creole although there is no real separate native group anymore on the island. Taino society was governed by a cacique, which roughly translates to chief in English, and there were about five large chiefdoms or cacicedoms on the island of Hispaniola when the Spanish arrived in 1492 with Christopher Columbus, which of course vastly altered life for the Taino people there as they were soon fighting unsuccessfully against the Spanish as well as against European diseases that were brought by them. The Spanish called the island Hispaniola, which is still what the entire island is called today, and they settled a few different places on the island as important refueling stations between Spain and the rest of the New World. One of these places and the largest colony would be called Santa Domingo or Saint Dominic, and just as in other places in South and Central America, the native Taino people on Hispaniola would become enslaved and abused by the Spanish. The Spanish, of course, were not long alone in the New World as a European power, and soon the island bases became attacked by the likes of the French, English and the Dutch, often as privateers or buccaneers. And as such, and because the Spanish were more involved in the continent of South America and Central America and taking riches from empires there, like the Aztecs and the Incas, they focused their settlements more on the eastern two-thirds of the island. And this meant that the western part of the island actually became settled by some of these largely French buccaneers who were quite successful in convincing other French colonists from other colonies in the New World to come and settle there as it was good ground to be growing tobacco and sugar and other luxury resources like that. And eventually the French became involved, the French crown itself, and claimed it as one of their colonies. And they often fought skirmishes against the Spanish, who of course were in the, east, in the western two-thirds of the island. That is until 1697 with the signing of the Treaty of Reisweg, which officially split the island between the two powers. Hold on a minute, Reisweg, that's not that place near Den Haag, is it? So that means it's...
Just as the Spanish had called their colony Santa Domingo, now that it was under French control, they called it Saint Domingue. And they imported because they realized it was very good soil to be growing crops like sugarcane and tobacco, for which they needed thousands of African slaves, which they took from the coast of largely West Africa and then transported to the Caribbean to put them to work. Again, because by this time, the Taino had almost been completely wiped out by the diseases and the maltreatment of the Spanish and later also other European powers. This came to the point where in 1788, so many African slaves had been brought over that they outnumbered the Europeans, the other largest group there, by 10 to 1. And because they constantly were bringing over new slaves, because many of the slaves died again of diseases and maltreatment and overwork, it meant that there was a constant link back to Africa and the traditional customs and language that they'd had there. And this had a very important impact on both the society, the culture, and also the language in Haiti because of this transmission and this continued conversation, a cultural conversation, back with Africa among the slaves on the plantations. This and the fact that the French under the load of the Code Noir, which was signed in 1685 and essentially was a code for slave keeping, meant that they had to convert the new slaves to Roman Catholicism. It actually led to a process whereby the continued arrival of new slaves from Africa, keeping the old, often Yoruba from West Africa religious traditions alive, as well as then being introduced to Catholic saints, they then conflated their own gods from spirits from back home with these new Catholic saints and this led to a creation of a kind of syncretic religion where elements of both were melded together on the slave plantations and this in turn created a new belief set that is still followed by many in Haiti and in similar forms across the African diaspora in Caribbean and South America and which we today might call voodoo. These practices went on in secret often at night and were declared illegal by the French authorities and there was a great deal of misunderstanding about what exactly was going on as well as some aspects of the African religion that we today would consider to be particularly barbaric that went on during this time and that caused a lot of misunderstanding between the two different groups in Haiti. A lot of the time as well slaves would escape into the wild interior they would be called maroons and would sometimes launch raids against the population there. And over time as well there was also a breakdown down of the racial hierarchy with the European white colonizers being there on the plantations as well as then having the slaves and there was a group that grew to be free people of color or as they were called in French Jean de couleur. Jean de couleur while having a few freed black people were mostly made up of people with one white parent or one black parent or of mixed race ancestry and they would be treated depending on the percentage of which racial makeup that they had and so they formed a kind of middle category between the free white and the enslaved black people that was in the middle. Now in 1789, of course, the French Revolution took off in France and this was also exported to its colonies and soon the Jean de Couleur in 1790 pressed for more civil rights and freedom to bring them on par with the white minority that was in power there. However, they were put down by the colonial forces there and they did not receive the rights that they wished to gain. However, this proved only to be the spark that would light the fire as the next year in 1791, there was a full on slave rebellion in the north of Haiti. They rebelled, they killed the plantation owners and anyone else on the plantation that wasn't with them. And then under the leadership of Toussaint Louverture, he created the first Haitian army of free slaves and set about bringing the rest of the French part of Haiti under his control, together with the help of the Spanish, who of course controlled the western two thirds of the island of Hispaniola, he fought against the French. Now, the French in the meantime with the French Revolution knew that there was a slave rising going on, but they couldn't act very quickly. And so they sought to gain allegiance from the Jean de Couleur to give them more promised freedoms. And in fact, in 1792, slavery was abolished across the entire French Empire, now the French Empire of the French Republic. However, they soon came under attack in Haiti from not only the British, who saw this as a French satellite state, but later on the Spanish as well after relations had broken down with the Spanish. However, the Haitian army of free slaves was able to beat both of them off, often with the help of diseases on the island. And by 1799, the foreign powers had left the Haitians to themselves and the only conflict was internal. 
The largest conflict was called the War of the Knives and pit the freed slaves against the semi-free Jean de Couleur who were fighting on behalf of the French and this war went on for another year. However, Toussaint Louverture was successful and managed to defeat the forces of the Jean de Couleur and most of these mixed race individuals would flee from Haiti and settle elsewhere in the French diaspora in the Caribbean and for the rest of the Americas. In 1802, Napoleon Bonaparte sent some 40,000 soldiers and sailors to retake the island from the control of Louverture. However, the French forces became bogged down by the guerrilla style of fighting employed by the Haitians who knew the land well. This was on top of the fact that more French soldiers were dying of yellow fever and other tropical diseases than were being killed by the enemy, which was a problem when Europeans from a European climate who'd never been to the Americas were suddenly sent to a tropical environment and expected to camp there whilst fighting against an almost invisible enemy, as well as then of course being subject to attacks from the Haitians the entire time. The French were however successful in capturing Louverture, who they took back to France, jailed in a castle in the Alps and who died in 1803 of exposure. However, the Haitians found a new leader, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who continued to lead the Haitian forces against the French and was successful at driving them back in several of the skirmishes. They were also aided in this in one of history's very interesting twists by the fact that around 5,000 of the French soldiers that were sent there weren't actually French but were Poles. They came from Poland and served as part of the Polish Legion and after having fought against the Haitians on the side of the French they actually changed sides and aided the Haitians as Poland at that time had been split between three large powers that of Prussia, Austria and Russia and at the time the Poles understood that the Haitians were all also fighting to be self-sufficient to have an independent nation and so they turned against the French and fought on the side of the Haitians. And this actually is only one small part of a very interesting history of Polish people in Haiti which I think would be an interesting topic to make a video about because also after the Haitian Revolution they were given a special place and special treatment in Haitian society and there are still people of Polish origin living in Haiti called Polish Haitians. So if you'd be interested in seeing that then leave a comment in the comments below and let me know and I'll make a video on the Polish contribution to Haitian independence. The Haitian army and their new Polish allies as well as with the effect of largely yellow fever but also typhoid and other tropical diseases managed to inflict around 24,000 casualties on the French when they were trying to invade Haiti. And in 1804, the French gave up and Haiti had, in essence, declared its independence from France. This was especially after the Battle of Vertières, in which a French standing army was soundly defeated. This war was known for its cruelties on both sides, the French treating the prisoners of war incredibly harshly and treating them as runaway slaves and killing them on the spot, often torturing them, while the Haitian rebels were also extremely ruthless in their dealings with any of the population who were helping the French or were suspected in doing so, as well as with French prisoners who were killed on the spot. Now a little tangent that I hope you'll forgive is that if you remember the original people on the island were the Taino, the native people, several thousand of them had escaped the brutality of the Spanish and lived up in the mountains and had actually fought alongside the freed slaves against the French and Dessalines remembered this afterwards and this is why the island became known as Haiti which came from Haiti the Arawakan word which means land of the mountains and that's why Haiti today has a native name because those few Taino that were left fought on the side of the slaves against the French and this was also preserved in the name of the army of Dessalines Celine which he called and he actually named the army the Incas and often in his writing he either refers to les rouges which are the red so the red men so the Native Americans or the Incas which apparently had become a name for the natives even though they aren't the Incas of Machu Picchu and Cusco uh, from Peru obviously but this was just the name that he gave them but he also called the Haitian army first the Incas then the army of the sun and later the indigenous army in honor of those Taino who had fought on his side. Now this is all nice and good but Dessaline also decided to massacre the remaining whites on the island, even those that had actively helped them and been sympathetic to the slaves during the time. And he had them massacred, leading to the deaths of around 4,000 people, with the exception of, of course, the Polish soldiers that I could make a separate video about, and some of the German colonists that were also on the island. 
The power seems to have gone to Dessaline's head as he decided to crown himself as uh, Emperor Jacques I of Haiti and he was soon ousted in a coup and killed in 1806. Following the death of Dessalines, Haiti split into two, with a kingdom developing in the north an absolutist state, while in the south there was a more liberal republic. Very interestingly, in 1815, the south gave help to Simon Bolivar, who would lead to the independence of many of the South American nation nations becoming Gran Colombia, and gave him support that was crucial to his victory as well as to other revolutionaries in South America. The split state of Haiti didn't last very long as in 1821 the two were reunited into one Republic of Haiti. Now in 1825 the French, which at this time once again had a monarch, sent a large fleet in order to recapture Haiti and the Haitians knew that they would not be able to fight off this attempt and so instead they got to the talking table and France promised that they would recognize Haiti in exchange for a vast sum of money and this sum of money was around 150 million French francs which was an enormous amount in which the Haitians couldn't pay off all at once. However, the Haitians agreed as this would lead to the security of their independence, the recognition of their independence by the French, which they had not yet done, and so they took it on. But to pay it off, they had to take out loans at very high interest from several Western nations. Now, this was quite difficult because they did not have the money to pay them back, and with the high interest, it meant that it impoverished Haiti for centuries to come, and arguably, the poverty in Haiti that is seen today, as well as being due to corruption and several other factors, is largely down to this debt that they had to pay back to France and to those foreign investors as well. And it wasn't paid back in full until 1947. Now, they were also not recognized by many large Western powers like the United States for several reasons. The United States, for instance, was blocked from formally recognizing the independence of Haiti for several centuries because actually until 1861, Southern senators feared that by recognizing a nation that had been established by revolting black slaves, the same would happen. And of course, with the amount of slaves on plantations in the Southern states, it meant that they didn't want to recognize such a state state as Haiti. But in 1861, when the Confederacy split off from the United States, it meant that it could pass and so the Northern Senators allowed it to happen. Now in 1844, in the eastern part of the island of Hispaniola, as the freed slaves had been able to take over the entire island, an organization called La Trinitaria that wanted to regain independence for the Spanish-speaking colonists in the eastern part of the island rose up and rebelled against the Haitian government and formed their own nation, which would become the Dominican Republic. In 1849, another emperor in Haiti was declared and he was called Emperor Faustin I and he attempted to regain the eastern part of the island by fighting against the Dominicans but he was soundly defeated and soon after in 1859 he was killed and ousted from power. The rest of the 19th century would be politically rather unstable although relations with the Dominican Republic did solidify and they agreed to recognize each other's mutual independence and this ended the Haitian idea of controlling the whole island of Hispaniola. There was also some modernization in terms of the economy and the infrastructure in Haiti, although as we'll see, that didn't really get very far indeed. However, by the start of the 20th century, they were still paying off these debts and the country was extremely politically unstable. And this started largely in 1911, as from 1911 to 1915, over six presidents were killed in assassination attempts in Haiti, which marked the incredible unstable nature of the period. Now at this time, German colonists who were only around 200 in number had a disproportionate amount of power and controlled around 80% of the land through marrying into Haitian families as Haitian law said that foreign citizens couldn't own the land. But by marrying into Haitian families, these German colonist families were able to have a very large amount of influence over the island's politics and economy. The influence of the Germans in one of the islands of the Americas greatly worried the Americans Americans, although remember 1915 is still before the Americans had joined the First World War so this should be seen more in the Monroe Doctrine in which the Americans reserved the right to get themselves involved in the Americas to stop other foreign powers gaining a foothold. Their banks also had a large interest in the Haitian economy because they actually had taken control over a large section of the Haitian
Mexican National Bank confiscating some $500,000 for their own. And in 1915, the United States, after the president in Haiti was once again killed by a lynch mob, decided to send in the US Marines. The United States occupation of Haiti brought about both positive and negative effects for the people that lived there. For example, they built around 1,700 kilometers of roads and bridges where before there had been virtually none, as well as greatly improving the economy and teaching farmers how to be more efficient, as well as introducing new crops that could be sold on an international market. However, many of these roads and infrastructure projects were built using the corvée system, which essentially meant that random people could be dragged from their homes, often at gunpoint, and forced to build them on pain of death. This is on top of the fact that around 3,000 Haitians were killed by American soldiers during their occupation. This led to mounting pressure for the United States to pull out, and in 1930 they promised to do just that, leaving the island in 1934. However, the state, the weakened state of Haiti would be revealed as there were tensions along the border with the Dominican Republic, where the dictator Rafael Trujillo used a hatred of Haitians, many of whom lived along the border strip with the Dominican Republic and across the border, to gain a kind of populist momentum. And he called out what became known as the Parsley Massacre, in which 20 to 30,000 Haitians living across the border in the Dominican Republic were murdered by the Dominican army. In 1946, the Haitian army itself would overthrow the elected president Lescott and install into power another candidate, Dumarsay Estimé. Estimé came from a humble background and so decided to expand the schooling system and generally upheld the rights of the black Haitians, who were often of a lower social class than the descendants of the mulatto or the mixed race of white and black uh, people that often had more power in Haiti than the black people did. And so he also sought to create a kind of social security system and to reorganize Haiti's economy in order to redistribute things to the poorer people in society, which of course brought him no favors from the mulatto people. He also decided to incorporate the voodoo religion alongside Roman Catholicism as an equal religion. And this was a step too far, as well as his other policies as the mulatto elite who until that time had supplied most of the presidents in the country rose up against him with the army and ousted him from power in 1950 which led to the coming to power of Paul Magloire an army colonel which brought back the old days where the elite and the army were needed to become the president However, he was incredibly corrupt, and in 1954, when Hurricane Hazel hit the island, it became clear that he had funneled money from the hurricane relief funds into his own private bank account, as well as building many private mansions for himself and his officials, and granting monopolies on various produce. This disillusioned all Haitians against him. To make matters worse, Magloire did what many other presidents had done before him, which was to change the date of his termination in office so that he would have longer in power. This led to a mass strike in 1956, and soon he was ousted from power. The next man to take power was none other than François Duvalier. He is an incredibly famous figure and he is featured in a documentary that will be linked in the description below on Magellan TV, but he is more commonly known as Papa Doc. And this was because his son would later also become a dictator, but he was in fact a doctor and that's why he was known as Papa Doc. And he became quite a figure in Haiti and he was not very well known, but he sought through underhand means to get the military on side. And because the military were hosting the next election, it essentially meant that all avenues steered to him. And so he won very comfortably in that election and therefore became the president of Haiti. It soon became clear, however, that he did not have the best interest of the Haitian people's health in, at heart, as he founded the VSN or Les Volontaires de la Sécurité Nationale, who became more commonly known by their Haitian Creole name of the Tonton Makout, which is called after a kind of spirit or deity that is worshipped in the voodoo religion on Haiti that would come and take naughty children and basically beat them in a sack, as this is what they ended up doing to many of the people in Haiti, and it's estimated that in about a decade's time they had murdered around 30,000 Haitians, as well as using sexual violence and intimidation to cow the Haitian people into following his lead. 
Duvalier also promoted the voodoo religion and was an avid practitioner himself, and it's often been said that he himself was some kind of voodoo priest. While this is not known for certain, it's certain that he did promote this image as being a man of the people and also incorporated many hongan, or these priests of the voodoo religion, into the Tonton Makut. Duvalier promoted the black middle classes and actively assaulted those of the mulatto elite that had ruled for such a long time, causing many of them to leave Haiti for mainly the United States in search of a more secure future, which worsened Haiti's economic problems as it was a kind of brain drain, as these were the more skilled laborers and uh, people of science that were leaving the country. In 1964, Duvalier proclaimed himself president for life and there were no more elections. However, in 1971, he died, so it turned out to be a short period. However, he was followed by his son, Jean-Claude Duvalier, who is more commonly known as Baby Doc, as he was Papa Doc's son. He continued to be fairly brutal in his repression, although compared to the reign of François Duvalier, his father, it seemed to be a little more lenient. However, he soon got into trouble by marrying a mulatto woman when his father had been so against the mulatto elite, especially when it became public that this wedding ceremony had cost around $3 million when most Haitians were living in poverty. This, coupled with an outbreak of swine fever, an AIDS epidemic in Haiti, as well as in 1983, the Pope at the time calling out the regime and saying that he should step down, led in 1986 to a general revolt against his regime, and soon the army had turned against him and he fled. The army then took control and there was a range of different candidates that came and went in 1987. One of the most shocking events being the massacre of around 300 people in the Haitian capital who were lining up to vote when the army tried to take power and to rig the election once again. Things that kept occurring until 1990 when winning 67% of the vote was Jean-Bertrand Aristide. Although his agenda of reform greatly worried the elite and the army and in 1991 he was ousted by the military once again who then began cracking down on all dissenters in Haiti from 1991 to 1994 killing an estimated 5,000 people. This caught the attention of the United States who in 1994 sent a mission to intervene in Haiti and thus overthrew the military dictatorship there. Aristide was able to return and in the 1995 election his political partner René Préval won the election. However, the two men fell out and, uh, he's, uh, and Aristide began his own party which in 2000 won 90% of the vote. However, in 2004, an anti-Aristide rebellion began in the north of Haiti, being led by a group called the NRFLRH, or the National Revolutionary Front for the Liberation and Reconstruction of Haiti. They quickly gained ground and soon they were in the capital Port-au-Prince and Aristide had to flee to the United States. However, Aristide would later claim that the United States essentially kidnapped him with special forces changing into uniform only when they were on the plane that was carrying Aristide out and said that he had been ousted from power by the United States, a claim which the United States denies. This was followed in Haiti by a series of natural disasters, such as a great storm in 2004, and of course in 2010, the incredibly deadly Haitian earthquake that potentially claimed the lives of around 200,000 to 300,000 Haitians. This was further exasperated by a cholera outbreak that was led from waste from a United Nations station being dumped into the river that also killed several thousand people. In 2015, Jovenel Moïse steps onto the scene as a presidential candidate in the 2015 electoral race. He ran in 2015 and got around 33% of the vote. However, his opposition claimed that this was a fraudulent result as some polls had only shown him polling around 6% of the vote. No matter what the truth of this is, there were violent protests against him, despite the fact that in 2017 he still was uh, called in as the next president. 
However, it wouldn't be long, just a year in effect in 2018, when there would be more violent unrest against his presidency, as he claimed that his term should end in 2022, whereas the opposition claimed that it should actually end a year earlier in 2021. This was coupled with the fact that he refused to allow a new election to happen when one should have been occurring, and he continued to push back the date for this, which further angered the protesters against him. This came at the same time in 2018 as there was a fuel crisis. Now, this was caused because the main supplier of oil was a company called Carib Oil, and basically they got their oil from Venezuela. And it was discovered that in previous regimes, significant bribes had been paid by presidents and their administrations to Venezuela. But when this scandal came out, Venezuela stopped supplying them with oil. And in 2018, they ran out of oil in Haiti. And so fuel prices increased massively. And this brought more people out into the streets demanding that Moise's regime should resign. Around the same time, several coalitions of gangs had become incredibly powerful in Haiti, especially in the capital Port-au-Prince, and were making a great deal of money by kidnapping ordinary civilians and then sending ransom notes to their family, killing them or otherwise abusing them if they didn't pay up. This was especially a problem because it appeared that the government were working together with some of these gangs as the gangs openly supported one faction or another. This takes us to February 2021, where there are reports that there was a planned coup against Moïse, but that this was foiled by the security agents. However, on the night of the 7th of July 2021, a group of gunmen were able to enter the presidential apartment in the capital Port-au-Prince and succeeded in shooting the president. Right before entering the house, they announced over a loudspeaker in a video that was filmed by a neighbor, DA operation, everybody back up, stand down, claiming to be part of the drug enforcement agency, which later it turned out they were not. In the following search, three of the gunmen were shot down by the Haitian police, while 26 others were found to have come from Colombia, and two were Haitian Americans, one of whom who had indeed been an informant for the DEA, but was no longer working actively for that organization. So, who was behind this? Something that's particularly suspicious is that Haitian officials have said that he should have been guarded by, at all times in his apartment by around 100 security personnel. But none of these personnel were killed and none of them were injured during the assault, which seems very suspicious given the fact that there should have been so many of them on guard at the time. And it perhaps indicates that this was somewhat of an inside job, if not a complete inside job in and of itself. Of the Colombians captured, most of them appear to have been ex-servicemen of the Colombian army, although they were now working for a private mercenary organization and the Colombian government doesn't appear to have any real motive at overthrowing the Haitian president as is clear yet. The current top suspect of the Haitian police is Christian Sanon, who is a Haitian who is living in South Florida and working as a doctor who had said that he wanted to overthrow Moïse and had for this purpose contracted a security firm to provide men to ensure his safety when he thought that the Haitians would lead a revolt against their leader. It does all sound very 19th century, but this is what the story is that the Haitian government are going for. The security form was called CTU Security, which was a Colombian organization, but based in Florida in the United States. And they indeed contracted to hire the mercenaries that were later caught at his house after having assassinated him. However, these mercenaries themselves claimed that they had been contracted as bodyguards, not as assassins, that they were meant to be guarding him and then to go in and to arrest him. However, when they got there, they claimed that they found him dead already, which if there's any credibility to the story, perhaps indicates that this was an inside job, which also corroborates the fact that none of the official uh, bodyguards there were injured or killed, and that they instead were there to take the blame as they thought they were just going in to arrest him. However, they went in extremely heavily armed, so whether this story is more believable is up to you. Another to be arrested was Gilbert Dragon, a former leader of the NRF LRH, who had brought an end to the Aristide regime in 2004. And so it's possible that he was also involved in this plot, but 
the gangs that I mentioned earlier as well also were extremely involved in the political situation in Haiti and it's possible that they too had a hand there either to get at one another or to overthrow the regime. But not much is incredibly clear at this stage and so we really don't know. I'd be curious to hear your ideas about this in the comment section. Have I overlooked any major details as there seem to be a lot of different lines that are going into this. But I thought it would be an interesting opportunity to talk about the history of Haiti with you all here today. So this has been my video on the history of Haiti and a little bit about the recent events that have happened on, uh, I say on the island, it should be on the part of the island that is Haiti. Do let me know in the comments below if you are interested to see a video on the Poles that fought for Haiti's independence and also what happened to that community after Haitian independence as there are still some Poles living there. I'd also be interested in looking a little bit more about the voodoo religion because I find these religious practices very interesting but there are many videos I need to make at the moment. Anyway, do check out Magellan TV as well who kindly sponsored this video and their documentary on Papa Doc. And before too much longer, I will say I have been Hilbert and this has been the history.